Welcome. This is James Corbett of CorbettReport.com, and it is currently the 4th of May, 2012. And once again, we're joined on the line by Syrian Girl. So, Syrian Girl, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for having me here. Well, as viewers and listeners might remember, we had you on the program a couple of weeks ago, a few weeks ago now, to talk about what's happening in Syria. But uh, obviously a lot has been happening since then. Why don't you bring people up to date about what's been happening? Well, as we all suspected, the ceasefire was a complete failure. And both uh, sides are... um, Russia is blaming the insurgency and NATO. Well, uh, Lavrov said it was the the countries who are funding the insurgency, and we all know who those are, um, for the break of the ceasefire. And this is because there's been a number of suicide bombings uh, in uh, Damascus area and in the Aleppo area, and in a a city called Idlib. Uh, Also, the the US side is blaming the uh, Syrian military and the Syrian government Um, But at the end of the day, if you look at whose interest it was for the ceasefire to break, it's clearly in the U.S. interest and in NATO's interest for the ceasefire to fail. So it can go back to the Security Council and uh, further uh, intervention, uh, probably uh, with sanctions, uh, UN sanctions, which won't be as the sanctions are now, where the sanctions are basically optional. You know, a country can choose to apply sanctions this year or not. UN sanctions imply that uh, the countries are uh, bound by international law all across the world to sanction Syria. So I think that that was the agenda behind putting up this ceasefire and then causing it to break. Now, um, the thing is, however, uh, that yes, there ha- have been a lot of bombings, but uh, as a result, the, the Russian Foreign Minister, uh, Sergei Lavrov, said that uh, these insurgent groups have to be squashed. So um, Syria's military has basically a green light from Russia to continue to um, push back these uh, groups who were given cover by the um, ceasefire agreement because uh, as a result of the uh, Syrian military pullback, now um, these insurgent groups have re- uh, regrouped and regrown and they're getting more brazen with their attacks. And yesterday um, in the city of Aleppo, the Aleppo University was attacked and uh, 22 Syrian soldiers uh, who, who came in uh, were killed. So, uh, you know, it's been a continuation of um, increasing momentum and bombings and uh, sectarian violence, people are getting kidnapped um, for ransom, some by uh, just criminals and some by criminals that are related uh, to these insurgent groups so that uh, it, it will help fund the insurgency. So um, that's, that's what's been happening recently. And exactly as you indicate, I think the pieces are just falling into place exactly as we thought they would with the media, of course, not reporting on such things as the Syrian troops being killed, but dwelling on on civilian deaths, uh, as reported by groups like Human Rights Watch, which came out with a uh, document recently purporting to document the the supposed uh, crimes against humanity committed by the Syrian troops in Idlib. So, of course, we see all of this playing out pretty much as as you say, as we thought it would. And uh, and you note Sergei uh, Lavrov, the foreign minister of Russia, is, uh, as always, trying to put the brakes on this process. But uh, realistically, I don't know what we can expect to come from that. What what do you really, I mean, do, do you think there's any way to derail this process as you've put it forward? Or do you think that, uh, that basically it's inevitable that the UN is going to be persuaded to, to act in that manner? Well, uh, you know, Russia could veto again. We... Um, it, it would be difficult for them to do so, but they, they still could. Uh, also, Syria is supposed to have some cards to play that it hasn't played yet. And um, the rumor is, and I, I can't prove that this is true, that Syria actually has captured foreign uh, troops from France and I think maybe Britain. And they're using, uh, and they're not actually saying anything about this in order to use it for leverage. So that could come out um, that uh, um, 
in the UN uh, Security Council that something like that could come out. Um, I, I'm not sure if at the end of the day they will get their sanctions. I don't feel that they will. However, it's not the be all and end all for them. You know, they are still destabilizing Syria and they're still creating, uh, this, uh, you know, it's, it's like a, um, an equilibrium right now. But at the end of the day, Syria is the loser because, uh, people are dying on both sides and uh, the bystanders are dying and the economy is, is getting more and more destroyed. So, uh, for Syria's enemies, it's still um, a good outcome for them. So something has to change. You know, something has to uh, be drastically changed from the Syrian side. Uh, otherwise, the the end game would be um, a divided Syria. Exactly right. I mean, I think it's it's obvious that the momentum is on the side of the people who are trying to destabilize the country right now because all they have to do is maintain chaos and make sure that the deaths continue to happen. And uh, that's that really is a type of win for them. So uh, it raises the question, I mean, what can really be done to swing the momentum in the other direction? What could be done to re-stabilize a country like this? Well, you know, the elections are planned for the 7th of May. And one the... The U.S. I find it uh, quite ironic is is quite uh, upset that the the elections are taking place, even though uh, this supposed um, de democracy that's supposed to happen. Also, you know, you have the opposition groups in Syria that are not linked to the um, insurgency. The insurgency uh, call themselves the Free Syrian Army. That th these opposition groups are um, internal and they're against. Uh, uh, foreign intervention and they're against the insurgency. But, you know, the, we're supposed to be told that, we're supposed to believe that this insurgency is pro-democracy when in fact um, it, it itself has led to some of these internal opposition members to flee the country to Lebanon. So, um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's quite clear that these people are not for democracy not for freedom of speech. They're just, they're after power and they have a very strong sectarian element in them. So if the elections take place and, you know, there's a good turnout and there's international observers, then it would be very difficult, uh, politically for the U.S. to continue to support, um, you know, at least out in the open to continue to support, uh, this, uh, sectarian element. What else? I, I'm not really sure. I, I feel, and, you know, this is difficult for me to say, but I feel a way out for Syria is to go on the offensive and to actually attack the countries that are sending in troops, money, uh, to destabilize Syria. So I think, you know, when it comes down to it, when Syria is cornered, it will probably attack either Israel or Turkey or uh, Qatar. So that's, that's one way out for Syria. Well, it certainly would at least make sense uh, from the perspective of, for example, if the U.S. was being attacked by some sort of insurgency that was uh, forming and, and getting funds from Canada or something, we would expect the U.S. would be invading Canada overnight. Uh, there wouldn't be any debate about it. So so one would see that that would be just a reciprocation. But, uh, but in the long run, I don't think that could possibly be an answer because, of course, that would be exactly the type of provocation that the U.N. and the international community is waiting for to, to justify a crackdown. Down on on Syria and to start the bombing. Well, I don't think they would mind to see a Syria Turkey war. Um, they, you know, Turkey wouldn't be quite happy about it, but they they would be pressured into it. So, um, you know, there was so much talk about a no fly zone at the very beginning, and there was so much talk of you know a potential World War Three. I still think that there is potential for that. However. Now, in reflection, I feel that it's just a, it's been a form of brinkmanship, where what the U.S. is just uh, you know, and NATO makes it seem as though they are ready to start a world war, and um, it's, it's playing a game of chicken. And Russia stepped up to this game and said, "Well, we are ready too." And, and then we just see escalation from both sides. And you wonder if there was any real intention for such a global war to happen. 
maybe maybe it will become this way maybe at the beginning it wasn't you know, it's hard to read but because of this I, i'm looking at syria's air defense syria has the fifth largest air defense in the world only surpassed by countries like russia the anti air missiles are, are quite effective so to have uh, in um no fly zone against syria is it's quite ridiculous because it would mean suicide for the planes that are sent in and looking at uh, nato and the us's history they always tend to attack countries that can't fight back and that are weak so i don't actually think that was an option to begin with i think that they made it seem that way to get these insurgencies uh, and foreign elements inside syria to continue to fight in the hope that they're going to receive foreign backing so um looking at things from this way you know if syria does ignite things and does start um a war it could be the you know someone's going to lose the war someone's going to win the war but you could you some might argue that that's the whole agenda of the new world order just to start a global war but if syria you know if syria is destroyed then it might start anyway it it might end up that way anyway because um syria is a very important piece of the puzzle for russia and to have at least one country in the middle east that can um threaten the missile defense treaty so uh it's it's feel if if war is going to start either way it's better to start it uh on our terms if you if you know what i mean I do I do understand that but I I always hesitate at that because I don't think global war can be can possibly be an answer and in a good way but I understand that it does seem that they're setting it up uh, to to happen anyway of course always the people lose and uh the military uh, powers uh, that be are uh, unfortunately always going to win in those types of scenarios so we there's has to be a way to find that we can I guess uh, engineer some sort of situation where the so-called leaders can have their sa- face saving moment and and de-escalate the situation but again it's difficult to imagine what that would look like but let's let's step back and let's take a look at that bigger agenda that you talk about because obviously Syria is just one piece of a much larger puzzle that's going on on an international scale right now and uh, we bring in the specter of the new world order a global government global wars these types of things um what, what where do you think the syria situation finds itself in that bigger picture well you know the reason to attack syria is not just one reason there's many reasons and of course you know as i talked about last time one of the reasons is israel uh and because syria is uh a gay, um in opposition to Israel and has been for many 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 decades in fact since the inception of Israel Syria has been one of uh Israel's enemy number 1 and they stand in the way of um is Israel's plan to grow but also you know an attack on Syria is an attack on Russia and um it's also because um it's an attack on Iran it's also a way on attack uh, on China and if you look at the um what's happening right now with the war games in the south china sea you know, where syria fits in it's not just you know a country that just another country on the list you know it's it's sitting in such a place that is between asia and europe and um there was talk of a pipeline going through uh, iran iraq syria which would uh um rival the pipeline that's that's already there the tbc pipeline that's going through israel so uh all of this going around syria it's it's not just the internal politics in syria that are are determining what's happening it's much more the external politics around syria that is creating the situation inside syria and that's uh, uh nato and the, the us and um israel's rivalry with russia china iran um the um the emerging emerging countries i know they have they have a name i i forgot about uh, what the, it is the brick countries the brick the brick countries yeah so um that's what's happening right now it's almost like the return of the cold war anyway 
Yes, that that has definitely been posited a number of times by a lot of different people. So so let's examine that because ultimately this is the type of thing that can demotivate a lot of people to be interested in this because it seems like this thing that's overwhelming, that's something that the average person out there can't do anything about. This is something that's taking place at the UN Security Council and other things that we just watch unfold on the nightly news like some sort of horror movie. But it, it, what what is the way that people can find to actually insert themselves into this to actually make a difference? in the type of political calculus that's happening in the region? Well, I, that's a very important question. I wish I had more to do. I don't, I'm not sure if what I do is making any effect, but um, the least that one can do is to speak out, to educate yourself, to educate others, and to speak out. The more people speak out, the more people seek alternate media, and stop paying attention to mainstream media, um, the more that you can't be lied to. Um, there's, you know, there's uh, activist uh, movements, uh, one that is uh, being led by Ken O'Keefe that is trying to uh, create a trade between Palestine and the rest of the world. Um, and that, I think, you know, something like that really has an effect on the ground. Um, but I'm, I wish I could make better advice for people, but it's a question that I myself don't really have the answer to. Well, I think we're all struggling with the answer, and I think it can only come in whatever way each of us is situated, and that's going to look very different for, for a Canadian living in Japan or whoever also out there might be listening to this conversation, everyone's in their own situation. So I, I agree, though, that uh, that one of the fundamental ways that we are led into war after war is through the lies. And I think that we're living in a fundamentally different paradigm than we were, say, a decade ago when the U.S. waltzed into Afghanistan and uh, and the vast majority of the people in America and a lot of people around the world supported that action based on the lies about 9-11, for example. So uh, I think we're in a different media paradigm, and I think it would be a lot harder to start that type of broad military intervention, barring some sort of cataclysmic event that uh, that we often talk about that might be coming, for example, in the Strait of Hormuz. Along those lines, what do you think? Uh, do you think that that the, the public is at a point where they might be able to see through a, a transparent fraud like a, a false flag event? Well, after the Iraq War, I would have said that because you know, two years after Afghanistan, people were totally against the Iraq War. But then what we saw in Libya was that the media was so uh, powerful that, in fact, a lot of people were convinced that uh, Libya was the right thing to do, even people that are staunchly on the left. So um, I think that, that the mainstream media is always trying to uh, find new ways to fool people uh, into thinking that it is a fair and balanced media. Uh, what they did in, uh, with Al Jazeera um, they, they set it up to be this uh, opposition to the U.S. and pro-democracy. Uh, and, uh, and then they turn around and they back something else up. So people don't know where to look. So while their media has, uh, lies have become more sophisticated because people have become more educated, unfortunately, I think in some ways it is still being successful. And that's because people forget the axioms of politics. People just should remember that countries act in a way to gain power. That is number one thing you should think about. There's no question about humanitarianism. Aid is just a way of control. Every action that they do is to gain influence and to gain control. You can put an ideology aside. All of that is just paint for the walls. If, if, you, if you start to think along those lines, it would be very difficult for you to be convinced by, by the media of uh, the positive thing of um, attacking countries. That's exactly right. And, and that applies not just in international politics, but in internal politics as well. Of course, anything that helps to expand the government's control over its own people is also welcomed, which is exactly why false flag events work so well, because they get people to rally around the flag and support the people who secretly are. Uh, working against their best interests. But uh, again, I think there is a growing number of people who are aware of these tricks. And it's a question of if it's enough of a percentage to actually make a difference when the when the time comes. But, uh, but again, playing out from here, I mean, uh, we're still looking at what's happening in Syria. It's still unfolding. Uh, Egypt, again, is still going undergoing its 
throes of rev revolution of, of one sort or another with people now trying to get rid of the military dictatorship, but, uh, but maybe just installing the Muslim Brotherhood. And happening in country after country, um, it, it's not a very pleasant picture in any, in any field that we're looking at. So I guess, once again, the question becomes, what, what do you think, A, is the, the likely short-term uh, consequences of this, and B, in the long-term agenda, if we are looking at some sort of uh, global conflict for the institution of some sort of global body or whatever, what, what do you think are the long-term likely consequences of this agenda? I think that uh, the consequence uh, in the long-term is going to be a lot of death, a lot of poverty, uh, in order for this uh, world, new world order, this new global government to take place and absolute power corrupts absolutely. So you can rest assured that such a world government is not going to have the people's best interests at heart. Um, I think that, you know, um, the wars that are going to create this could have ramifications that will last for uh, thousands of years if nuclear weapons are uh, used. Um, in the short term, I think that stability is going to... Uh, well, my view of what's going to happen is positive. I, I actually believe that stability is going to return to Syria. I believe that uh, the, you know, the um, foreign countries that are funding insurgency are going to back off and they're going to realize that uh, the you know when well, they're not actually going to to gain anything by continuing to put money into this and and I feel I just don't see um, because so much time has passed by uh, and Syria is still standing I think we're going to come out of this as a whole country that a stronger country and um, that this world war that they want to happen maybe it will be delayed for a long time to come. Well, we can only hope and we can only do what we can to forestall the coming of that war. So uh, any, any other points or any final thoughts you'd like to leave people with today? Um, I can't think of anything right now, I'm sorry. Well, let me suggest to you, um, one of the courses of action that I recommend for people at all times and all points is to try to withdraw themselves from the systems of control as much as possible, because it, it seems to me that people feed into it by even what products they choose to purchase on a daily basis, which support the corporations, which support the government corporation nexus, which is the military industrial complex, et cetera, et cetera. And that, uh, and that the more that people can get off of the, the grid in whatever sense that might be, whether literally in terms of energy or whether in terms of food, uh, growing things in their back garden, that's something that I always try to uh, encourage people towards is to try and get away from feeding that beast system with their, their dollars or yen or pesos or whatever it may be. Uh, uh, what do you think about that as a type of strategy for people becoming involved in this? I think that um, definitely, for you know, it does it does help to boycott uh, specific companies that uh, are, have weapons contracts and that uh, fund apartheid states such as Israel. Um, I also think that it's not just what you buy, but who you work for. Um, you should boycott, you know, working for certain companies. Um, it's it's not okay to be part of something that is um, going to kill people, no matter how far you are down um, the line. Uh, also, um, it's it's good to uh, unplug your television, as I said before, and and start educating people around you about what's happening. Um, there was something I wanted to say, but now I forgot. <laughs> well, when when you remember, I, we can get you back on the program to talk about it. All okay. right. Well, let let's leave it there for now. But uh, tell people once again what your YouTube and uh, Twitter accounts are, so they can follow you. Okay. So my YouTube account is um, Syrian Girl Partisan, and if you Google uh, Syrian Girl, some of my videos might come up, and my Twitter account. It's just partisan girl, um, and I also have a Facebook, but there, all all of the information is is in those. 
All right, excellent. Well, people can certainly find you, but don't use Google. Use startpage.com. It's a little bit better for privacy. On that note, <laughs> we'll leave it there. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much.